Joseph threw himself on his sorry. Joseph threw himself on his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. So the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was the time required for embalming. And the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. All right. So this can we see this man Joseph a completely emotionally free man? This man is he's not afraid to ball, show affection. This is a this is a, a guy who is very, very open emotionally. And so we see him again. And now look at that. The Jews have a totally different burial practice from the Egyptian. So J Jacob is getting the burial of an Egyptian. Right? The, the Egyptians are known as some of the most skilled embalmers of all times. Mm. And so here he's being embalmed by the Egyptians. So 40 days of embalming, embalmment, and then they mourn for him 70 days. I'm not sure if the 40 is including the 70, but whatever. 70 days. My understanding is that kings were mourned. In Egypt, kings were mourned 72 days. And so the kings were only getting two days over and above what Jacob got. Now, this is significant, you know, mm -hmm. because the, the, the Egyptians honored Jacob, you know, and Joseph. They recognized that somebody special was among them, right? Joseph was special, but they recognized his father also as special. And out of the honor for Joseph and Jacob himself, self, they treated them with honor. So they, they gave him an Egyptian embalmment. And you would all know that even today, even nowadays, when they dig up the, the graves in Egypt, they're finding well-embalmed bodies. There are very few cultures in which bodies have been preserved like that. You know, they have found some in the very cold regions, but that's different. They have found, there's one I was looking at, a, a girl and a man. Because the areas are so cold, those bodies were preserved. But that's nature that preserved that. This now was an, a, a scientific skill that the Egyptians had developed in, in terms of embalming. And so, you know, that's what he got. Let's read on. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, if I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, my father made me swear an oath and said, I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father. Then I will return. Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father as he before may. Before you go further, Shaista, you notice how honorable this man is. Yes, he's a prince of Egypt, but you don't find him um, usurping and rude. You see, that, that's, that, that's a cultivated thing where you, you still understand how to address Pharaoh. You, you're still giving him his due respect. You know what, when to approach him, when he goes, when you go through some of his departmental heads or whatever it is. And you notice what he says. Let me bury him. I will return. Now, some people have said, no, if me go, me not come back, you know. If me go, me not come back. I am going to establish myself, take my freedom. But I think, listen to this very carefully. Joseph knew where God wanted him. He knew by now that God had positioned him in Egypt. It is very important to, need, to know where God positions you. You might have a job and God has purposely positioned you there. You might be living in a community and God has positioned you there. Do not be quick to move from it. Right? Some of us know we don't even know we, because we have not been even walking with God properly. We just said we accept Jesus and that's the way it ends. But we don't have a clue whether or not the job we're in, the community we live in, is really the will of God because we didn't care enough. Right? To find that out. So, but he says, I will return because he knew where he was, God's will was for him. And he would eventually die there in Egypt because that was the will of God for him. All right, let's go on. Pharaoh 
Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father as he made you swear to do. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court and all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with him. It was a very large company. Right. A very large company. And every time I see this on the court, chariots went up with him. And this was long before Jesus. And Jesus never one day sought to ride a chariot. That there's never recorded in scripture. So it's not that it didn't exist. You know, the Romans had splendid chariots. They also had ox carts and more humble animal transport. But he never chose to ride one. He did transport himself in a boat, yes, and in a donkey. But those are the only two means of travel that I can find in the scriptures that Jesus took. Right? And um, that's very, very significant. It means God was trying to make a point. And we must never let that point escape us. Right? Continue. When they reach the threshing floor of you know, sorry, Kaiser, let me just say this before. It, it, it's looking at the honor that was accorded to Joseph. I mean, so many of Egyptians chose to go and mourned, mourn um, Jacob, right? Remember, this is 17 years he was there. <clears throat> the, the Israelites would have been having more and more kids in those 17 years, right? They got to see the honor of this man, and so they went up to honor him. Right. And they honored Joseph. Too. Joseph was a shoddy kind of guy who, who didn't do what he should. You think they would have given this kind of honor? No way. Right? Continue. Um, Pastor, you know, yes. there, there is a scripture in Proverbs that talks about if, if you see a man with skill, he will stand before kings. Yeah. Right. A man's gift. But that scripture, you know, yeah. contrary to what poor people interpret it, a man's gift will, will make him stand before a king, something like that. But that scripture is very misinterpreted because I think the context, context is really speaking about bribes. <laughs> but if you look at it carefully and study it in many versions, you might find that it's more applicable to him, the Bible saying, when a man pay a bribe, he will get before kings. And it, it is not supporting paying bribes, you know. It is just giving a fact to how the society was functioning. Okay. We're talking about Proverbs 22, verse 29. Did this one? Put it, up, put it up there. This is a, this is an aside, though. Do you see someone skilled in his work? They will serve. Oh, that's a different one. No, look at it. Look at the same one in King James for me. This is the King James. Oh, this is a different one. I think there's one that says a man's gifts will make... Shall, yes, and take away for him. That's the one I'm talking about. This is a different one. Yes, you're right about this one. The other one is where it says a man's gift. If you look up gift in King James, you'll see the other one. This is a different one. This is talking about diligence and competence. And that, we had mentioned that earlier on that when you are diligent, you're competent, and this is very appropriate. It's very, very appropriate for what we're looking at in terms of Joseph's life. Because this guy obviously was highly competent, highly diligent, and so when, it, when his father died, it, the whole troop went up, oh, Father, help us. It's so beautiful. Good. Oh, this is another one. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great, right? That's the one that is referring to bribes. Anyway, it's another time, another day for discussion. Let us go back to the passage. All right, Shaisto. Okay. When they reached the threshing floor of At Atad near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly. And there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. 
When the Canaanites who lived there saw the morning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, the Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. That is why that place near the Jordan is called Abel Mizraim. Yes, you can check it out in the footnote um, what it means there, um, Kirkland. But listen, um, this they looked Egyptian, right? It means um, mourning of the Egyptians, right? It, this whole troop had become Egypt, Egyptized, if there's such a word. Joseph for all intents and purposes, dressed like an Egyptian, looked like an Egyptian, you know, and as I mentioned one week, the Egyptians had very distinct, a very distinct look. So much so that when his brothers first met him, they did not recognize him, right? Because he was culturized into the Egyptian society, right? He would have spoken their language and a lot of Egyptians went up with them. So these people thought this was an Egyptian ceremony, you know. They really mourned a long time, you know. I, I, but the truth is maybe we do mourn too, but we do not express it in the same way. Because when people die or close to you, sometimes for the first six months to a year, they never ever leave your mind. We might not be keeping ceremonies and wearing special clothes, but the mourning goes on. All right, let's continue. Read on, Jackson. So Jacob's sons did as he had commanded them. They carried, they carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. When yeah, um, Joseph's... Can I ask a question? Yes, come on. Um, do the Egyptians speak the same language as the Hebrews? No. As the... No, no. They speak a different language. And the Egyptian culture was very advanced. They were one of the most advanced culture in their time. They, they had the former writing and they, they, they really were pretty advanced, you know? They I'm had just, their universities, huh? I was just wondering how, um, who is it, Jacob or Joseph? I don't remember. Joseph. How he went, yeah, how he went in there and, you know, able to communicate with them and, and all that. So. Right, because, well, one of the things, though, you know, you remember a number of things. One, society was pretty much the same in some ways as now, where you'd have had people interchange, trade, etc., between Canaan, where these people lived, and Egypt, and there'd have been people who were bilingual in the society. But pretty soon, Joseph would have learned the language. He was young and he was bright, so he would have learned the language. And throughout it, eventually, it seems the, the Israelites, a lot of Israelites became bilingual. Moses himself was very learned in the culture and customs and language, languages of Egypt. So it, it, it's just like now, if you go to live in Cuba, eventually you'll become very fluent in Spanish. And I keep telling Jamaicans that we are kind of monolingual. Or, you know, maybe we know a little, we know a lot of Patron and so and English, but they're very related. But in some countries, knowing five languages is very natural. Five languages. Because if you live like Europe, in the heart of Europe, where you're going to be exposed to, say, Poland, po Polish, you're going to come across a lot of Russians, because you're on the border, a lot of Russians in, in, peacetime and in friendly times are in your borders and you're in theirs, then you're on the border of Germany and you might be you might learn English in school. So sometimes they speak four to five languages and it's normal for them. You know. But they would have had translators and they would learn the language themselves soon. Alright? So let's read on. Let's see when, his brothers behave now. Go when, ahead. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us 
and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. <laughs> no, stop a bit. I mean, these guys are something else. What do you think about their actions? My conscience, man. <laughs> well, it's conscience. <laughs> I don't know if you even remember anything about that. Well, you'll see Joseph's response. And it begins by doing what Joseph enjoys doing, crying. <laughs> but, but truly, you know, if these guys knew God deeply, they'd have put their trust in God. They wouldn't have had to manufacture this whole elaborate thing. Right? Let's go on. So Joseph wept. Mm -hmm. Let's move. Let's move 18, verse 18 to the top there. All his right, go brothers, ahead. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, <laughs> they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Right. And that's the right attitude. And forgiveness is something the Bible tells us we must have. Forgive your brothers your sisters, people, your enemies. In fact, Jesus said, love your enemies. So let's go down to the end here now. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the, the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. How many three generations down he lived on Jatene and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children? So that would have been his grandkids, great grandkids, and great great grandkids. Wow, that's beautiful, right? Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died please, at the please age... Carry them in. Just hold. Yes, yes Miss Martin, go ahead. Um, that was just the way he say, God had a protect and carry them up. Matter about uh, Moses... When yes, Moses he's, actually, he's, he's actually seen into the future prophesying mm -hmm. and he knows mm -hmm. God has told him God has told him he, he is going to take them back out of Egypt, he told them long ago so he yeah. just think that prophecy that they're yeah. not going to be there forever I eat my get out of it I eat my get out of it very good, good, thanks so, all right, good continue, Mrs. Pasley. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Yes, praise God. When I was preparing this and I was reading this, I was saying, so why didn't he... I'll tell them, or tell the Egyptians, when I die, bury me in Canaan, right? And treat it the same way that Jacob was treated. And I thought, started to think about it. But it could be that without his leadership, it might be better they stay put, right? Because, you know, leadership takes a lot of spiritual closeness to God, um, knowing what to do. Joseph knew he had to go up there and come back. Um, these guys, how spiritual were they? So Joseph said no. Joseph knew that the day would come. And that's the second reason. He, it was a testimony. Both what happened to Jacob was a testimony and what happened to Joseph is a testimony. In Jacob's case, 
Bring me back to that place because that's where the promise is. In Joseph's, Joseph's case, he said, you will leave this place, put my bones right here, and when you're going up, take my bones. Because they knew the land that God had promised. And he, they knew God wouldn't fail them. And so in both cases, a testimony of the truth of God's word. God is good. If there are no questions, any questions or comments? Well, I think we need to thank God that we've re reached the end of Genesis. Um, reading the word of God takes discipline. I know sometimes, you know, it was the, the, the nice bubbly feeling, but, you know, just wading through the words. Oh, look how much you know now about Genesis. And so what we want to do next week, we want to, I'd love for you to, each chapter, to at least know the, the, the primary thought. This is not a memory verse thing now. Each chapter of Genesis was the primary thing that was being described there. And so we'll be doing, looking at that to close the book. So it's riveted in your understanding and you don't lose what we've spent so much time covering. So God bless you. And have a wonderful week. Remember to continue reading the word. Remember to go to your Bible study meetings. And remember to abide in prayer. God bless you.